when I was governor? Raise your hand. Well, Rock Hill. Rock Hill showed up today, Ralph. They really did. Look at this. It's a great night in South Carolina, for sure. Thank you so much for coming out. You know, whenever, when I was governor, and we're going to talk about all the fun things we did together, one of the things I'm so proud of is when you can spot someone who's going to be a fighter, when you can spot someone who's going to really work for the people and stay true to who they are, when you can spot them and you can lift them up and say, we need to see you do more. I am incredibly proud of the second I supported Wes Clymer for Senate. He has been a fantastic senator. Where'd you go, Wes? There you are. He fights for you, he represents you, but I love everything I think should be transparent. And he believes in transparency and he believes in making sure that everything is there for you to see. So thank you, Wes, for doing a great job. And boy, what a freedom fighter you've got in Ralph Norman. <laughs> D.C. doesn't get anything past Ralph. I mean, they don't. And Ralph, I've told you before, I can't wait till I get there and see what we do together because it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> so how many of you were not here when I was governor, raise your hand. Welcome to the best state in the country. <laughs> For the rest of you, I want to remind you about where we came from and what we did. Because when I came into office, South Carolina was hurting. We had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare. And South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. But what did we do? We rallied and we got together. And by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. And yes, they were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I still love. We moved that unemployment rate from 11% down to 4%. We announced jobs in every county in the state. We moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. We had the first body camera bill in the country. We did tort reform. We did pension reform. We cut taxes. We built up our coffers, and we acknowledged some truths. We said, if you've got to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, You've got to show picture ID to get on a plane. You should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. And by the time I left, we were named the friendliest state in the country. <laughs> the one I love, the most patriotic state in the country. <laughs> and don't blame me for this one, but we were named the number two state in the country people were moving to. <laughs> and now I'm running for president. It's been a year since I announced, and what a roller coaster it's been. We had 14 people in the race. We defeated a dozen of the fellas. I just got one more I've got to catch up to. give us a chance in Iowa. We started at 2%. We finished almost second at 20%. Then we went to New Hampshire. They said we were 30 points down in the polls, and we came in at 43%. And, and on that night, Donald Trump had a temper tantrum. 
Did you all see it? He was completely unhinged because he didn't know we were going to get 43% of the vote. And all he did was talk about revenge and my dress. <laughs> then the next day he goes and says, anybody that supports her is barred permanently from MAGA. Now think about that. If you're running for president of the United States, you want more people. It's a story of addition. You don't push people out of your club. You bring people in. Then the next day, he goes and tries to push the RNC to name him the presumptive nominee after just two states had voted. We don't anoint kings in America. We said the people of South Carolina deserve the right to vote, as do all the other states. He got pushback. And then we went and saw his campaign disclosures. And that's when we saw he spent $50 million of his campaign contributions on his personal court cases. Then he gets a judgment on a court case and he talks about how much of a victim he is. But the point I'm getting to this is whether it was the night of New Hampshire when he talked about revenge, whether it was after the first court judgment when he talked about being a victim, what bothers me the most is at no point did he ever talk about the American people. He never talked about the fact that we're $34 trillion in debt. He never talked about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. He never talked about the fact that we have an open border that is inexcusable and lawless. He never talked about all of the lawlessness in our cities. He didn't talk about the wars that are happening around the world. All he, bless you, all he did was talk about himself. And that's the problem. This isn't about him. What we need to be talking about is what American families are feeling. And right now, yes, we are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. For the first time, we're paying more in interest payments than we are in our defense budget. You know who's noticing that? Russia, China, and Iran. And I would love to tell you that all that debt was from Joe Biden. But I have always spoken to you in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you tonight. Our Republicans did that to us, too. First, you look under Donald Trump. We can talk about what a good economy it was, but at what cost? He put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years. He says that's COVID. That wasn't all COVID. That was less than 25%. He grew government, and he spent it on things that we didn't need to be spending it on. But you also look at what they did when they passed that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill with no accountability. They expanded welfare that left us with 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And did Republicans try and make it right? Nope, they doubled down and opened up pet projects and earmarks for the first time in 10 years, passing through 7,000 of them last year. In the 2024 appropriations budget, Republicans put in $7.4 billion worth of pet projects. Democrats put in $2.8 billion. Now you tell me who the big spenders are. All while one in six American families can't afford their utility bill, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 50% of American families can't afford diapers, and what we did, because when I came into office, 
night in South Carolina, for sure. Thank you so much for coming out. You kill. Rock Hill showed up today, Ralph. They really did. Look. One of the things I'm so proud of is when you can spot five international tire companies, and yes, they were referring to us as the B 